you. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining us tonight for um, this bonus lecture. This one's free. So, um, <laughs> if you didn't pay for the other ones, you know, we'll be collecting soon. Um, yeah, so thank you all for coming out. Um, thank you for braving the heat uh, and being here with us in this uh, thankfully uh, cool uh, classroom tonight. Um, again, uh, thanks to the, the Politics and Government Department as well as the Forensics Program here at UPS for their continued support um, of, this, of this program. Uh, my name's uh, Dr. Michael Artime. Um, I am, um, for the next very short period of time, uh, an adjunct professor at uh, University of Puget Sound um, and Tacoma Community College. I'll be starting uh, full time at uh, Pacific Lutheran in uh, in the fall. So, thanks. I'll turn things over to Mike. And I'm Mike Purdy. I'm a presidential historian in Seattle. Um, I've got a website, presidentialhistory.com, that you can take a look at. There's lots of good resources out there, including resources about this very interesting 2016 campaign. Um, and, and you can subscribe to the uh, my presidential history blog if you're interested. Um, you all know probably that we are recording all of the lectures, and the first six lectures are all online at presidentialhistory.com, so you can take a look at that. You know, as Michael and I uh, thought about this bonus lecture, you know, we kind of thought, well, maybe we should cancel it. I mean, nothing really has been going on, has it? <laughs> it continues to be really, really interesting, doesn't it? Um, so because of that, you know, we thought about, should we do more lectures? Yes. Yes. Yeah, you think so? Okay. So, so we're thinking about doing um, one in maybe early to mid-September where we would cover uh, what happened at the conventions, look at the vice presidential picks, think about um, what do the polls look like at that point in time. I feel like I'm getting an echo here. And um, then one in October where we would look at the uh, debates. So this would be maybe later October, so the debates would be over. Uh, the polling, what does the campaign look like, and, and maybe some additional predictions. Uh, Michael's going to make some predictions tonight at the end of the lecture in terms of uh, how he thinks the Electoral College is going to go. So those of you who have signed up on the email uh, list in the past um, will send you the notice of when the additional lectures are. If you're not on that list, there's a couple of pages down here on the table and go ahead and do that. Uh, it'll also be on uh, UPS's website and um, so you just want to be aware of when those happen. So tonight, uh, you know, it's called the last primaries, who will win the nominations? Well, I came up with that title when we didn't really know who was going to win the nominations. Uh, so things have changed a little bit. So tonight we're going to talk for maybe an hour, hour and 15 minutes on some material. Um, and then we'll take uh, maybe 10, 15 minutes of questions. And then those of you who want to stick around, we'll put the news up here and we'll watch the returns. Um, so there's already some returns that are coming in. But obviously California is going to be the big one. And we want to see what happens there on the Democratic side. So we're going to talk about the delegate counts, where we're at right now. Um, we're going to look at what has happened to the parties in terms of how they have both fractured. And you've got um, uh, extreme uh, positions on both parties. Uh, we'll look at the conventions a little bit, uh, peer into the general election, and what are some of the uh, issues and themes that are going to be out there, as well as what kind of uh, disruptive events might occur during the general election. And then we're going to do our, uh, somebody mentioned this a couple of lectures ago, uh, possible vice presidential picks. And so we'll go through uh, some of the possible picks on that and uh, chat about that. And then um, both Michael and I will make some closing reflections. Um, I'm going to kind of summarize uh, some big themes. Uh, and Michael's going to look at uh, the Electoral College and some analysis there and who is likely to win. So, but before we get there, 
our favorite part. <laughs> so this uh, long history, and, and you know, it is very different this time. Um, very different. We've had presidents insulting presidents in the past. We've had uh, candidates insulting other candidates, but nothing to this level ever before. So I'm not going to tell you whether these are from history or current. I'll let you get them. Yes. <clears throat> A bigoted partisan. Any ideas? Could, could be current, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, sounds like it. But it was actually James Polk talking about Zachary Taylor. Okay. A disgusting man. Coarse, dirty, clownish. Could be current. <laughs> It's, uh, it's a good guess. It's not uh, Jackson. It is uh, William Henry Harrison talking about John Quincy Adams. So they said some bad things back then. They didn't say as much, and they didn't say it on Twitter. So, <laughs> A cold-blooded, narrow-minded, prejudiced, obstinate, obstinate, timid, old, psalm-singing Indianapolis politician. So you think he had, you know, strong opinions about this person? <laughs> so this was Theodore Roosevelt, always very quotable, uh, talking about Benjamin Harrison. And then finally, ruthless. Trump on Hillary? May, he may have said that, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> um, actually, uh, William Howard Taft talking about Woodrow Wilson. But that's not all. Richard Nixon said it about Dwight Eisenhower. But that's not all. <laughs> Richard Nixon said it about Jimmy Carter. <laughs> so that seems to be a, a good word. If you don't know what to say, you just say ruthless. So Michael is going to give us a, um, uh, a summary of what the current status is of the race right now with delegates. Must feel really good to get called ruthless by Richard Nixon, I guess. <laughs> um, okay, so current state uh, of the primaries, they're over. That's the current state of the primary. So uh, on the Republican side, um, you needed 1237 uh, to win the Republican nomination. Trump has 1239 uh, right now. Um, he is winning in, in a couple states, which I'll talk about uh, here in just a minute uh, this evening. And so that race is is over. So um, you know, however you feel about that, you know, uh, take some time to uh, to 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 let that sink in. Um, on the Democratic side, um, Hillary Clinton, Bernie Sanders, um, you needed uh, 2,382 delegates to win the Democratic nomination. Um, the Associated Press yesterday declared um, that Hillary Clinton um, had those number. Uh, those number of delegates on her side, so they estimated that she had 1,812 uh, pledged delegates and 571 um, delegates who, who are super delegates, and added together that put her one delegate over the required number. Um, she is also uh, winning in some states tonight too, so even if you didn't like the Associated Press count, um, she is picking up enough delegates um, tonight. Um, to, to decidedly push her, uh, push her over the top. Um, you are going to hear her tonight um, give a victory speech uh, for the nomination. The real question is, what does Bernie Sanders do um, with that information? Does he say, you know, I will step aside and we'll move on to the general election? Or does he, as he's been uh, talking about, does he continue to, to push forward um, toward the convention and have um, what he has called uh, a contested convention? Uh, if we look at the popular vote margins, um, Hillary Clinton leads um, all candidates in this race uh, in terms of the number of votes. So she has uh, close to 13 million um, popular votes uh, in this election cycle. Uh, just under her it, with about 12 million or 11 and a half million is Donald Trump. Uh, and Bernie Sanders has close to, to 10 million 
votes. That's not including uh, some of the votes uh, tonight. Uh, if you're looking for uh, third party candidates, uh, perhaps your most uh, viable alternative to these uh, two major party candidates is the Libertarian Party. That is the only third party uh, ticket which is going to be on the ballot in all 50 states. Most likely, they're, they're on about 32 states right now, but they'll likely be uh, on all 50, uh, 50 state ballots uh, by, by the time that voting begins uh, in November. Um, the Libertarian Party for this election cycle, two former Republican governors. Um, there is Gary Johnson, uh, former governor of New Mexico, and Bill Weld, who is the former governor of Massachusetts. Um, it, is, it is a pretty qualified um, ticket. But we, uh, you know, a lot of people say that they're looking for an alternative. We've yet to see if people are, uh, you know, there's about 10% of the people right now who say that they would support the Libertarian Party. We have, we have yet to see whether that's because they endorse the ideas of the Libertarian Party or whether it's just that they are seeking out um, some alternative um, with two unpopular general election candidates. So we'll see uh, how viable this ticket is. Um, they would like to get to 15%. Uh, in the pop, they'd like to get to 15% support because um, that would put them into the general election debates. Okay. Um, and if they received 5% of the vote in November, then they would be eligible in future presidential elections um, for federal matching funds. So it would be easier for them to compete with the, with the two major parties. Um, the Green Party is also a, an alternative party, uh, more on, on the liberal end of the political spectrum. Um, the likely nominee for the Green Party is uh, Jill Stein. She's run on that ticket uh, before. Um, but they're not likely to be on all 50 state ballots, and so we'll see uh, how much of the popular vote they can receive uh, in November. Uh, Bill Crystal recently predicted that there would be uh, an impressive, he's a, he's a conservative commentator, uh, he said uh, that there was going to be uh, a candidate um, who was going to be a Republican candidate who would run as a third party and it would really shake up the election. He says that this candidate would be an impressive one with a strong team and a real chance. Um, and later on it was revealed that that potential candidate was David French. Um, you all, I'm sure, know a great deal about uh, David French. David French is a, uh, a constitutional law scholar. Uh, he is, he's a writer, um, and he decided not to run. So, <laughs> so that fizzled out uh, pretty quickly. Um, there, there's unlikely to be um, anyone significant from the Republican Party opting to, to run in this election. So... Trump is what you've got uh, on on that side of on that side of the aisle. Um, Trump uh, continues to say that he wants uh, Sanders to run as an independent, not not in any self-serving way or that that would benefit him, but because he feels that that Sanders has been treated unfairly and that this would be one way to uh, to get back um, at the establishment. Um, tonight. We have several states voting, California, Montana, New Jersey, South Dakota, North Dakota, and New Mexico. Uh, New Jersey has already been called um, for Trump and Clinton. Uh, South Dakota um, has been called for Trump. Uh, North Dakota has been called for Sanders. And New Mexico has been called for Trump. Um, so we're still waiting for some other calls um, in some of these states. The big uh, delegate prize uh, this evening is California, and their polls close in about 45 minutes. Um, if we look forward to the general election, this is just an, you know, an indication of where we are right now. Hillary Clinton, um, according to the Real Clear Politics Average, has about 44% of the vote. Donald Trump has about 42% of the vote. If that is true, that leaves about 14% of people who are currently um, undecided. Okay. Um, so, uh, so that's just a picture of where we are both in the primary process as well as looking forward to the general election. Now I'm going to turn things over to Mike who's going to talk about fractured parties. So we've got uh, fractured parties on both sides with, um, with, with Trump and with um, Bernie Sanders. So 
let's take a look at the candidate. Charismatic personality and speaker. Dedicated followers who idolize him. It's a big name. A sharp wit. Good memory for names and faces. Personal charm. Got mansions in different states. There's whispers and hints about the propriety and ethics of some of his business dealings. And he said his financial affairs were strictly a personal matter and he refused to discuss them or disclose them. So we all know who this is, right? <laughs> well, we think it is this guy, but that James G. Blaine 1884 those were things that were said about Blaine in 1884 he was the Republican candidate uh, Democrats uh, led by Grover Cleveland uh, had a campaign slogan taunting him Blaine Blaine James G. Blaine the continental liar from the state of Maine <laughs> He had tried for the Republican nomination in 1876 and in 1880, but had been thwarted because of ethical concerns. There were a lot of ethical concerns about, uh, about him. And he finally got the nomination in 1884, but there was a group of Republicans who said, we can't stomach this guy with his ethics. And they bolted from the Republican Party. This group of Republicans who bolted were known as the Mugwumps. And so they bolted from the Republican Party and they supported Cleveland. And their um, deserting the Republican Party probably was the margin that elected Cleveland. So if you take a look at New York State alone with 36 electoral votes in 1884, Cleveland won New York State by 1,141 votes out of 1.1 million cast. Had that flipped and Blaine had won New York, Blaine would have won the presidency. So these mugwumps uh, did change the course of history um, because they said they couldn't stand um, a, a man such as Blaine with his uh, very questionable ethics. So not all Republicans uh, today are voting for Trump, and this is a real dilemma for many Republicans. So I wanted to show you a real quick um, clip. This is actually an advertisement that the Clinton campaign did, um, piecing together what some Republicans have said about Trump. I am a unified, will you be a unified party?
So there are a number of very well-known Republicans who are being mugwumps, and they are refusing to support Trump, including um, both former President Bushes, uh, George H.W. Bush, George W. Bush, uh, Jeb Bush, uh, Mitt Romney, Lindsey Graham, uh, Tom Ridge, Ben Sass, Christine Todd Whitman, and most recently, just today, the senator from Illinois, Mark Kirk, who is probably one of the most endangered Republican senators in this election, he came out and he said, I know this may not be good for me politically, but I can't vote for Trump. Um, so, and, and there's a, obviously a longer list out there. We could look at Washington State. Uh, Chris Vance, who is running against Patty Murray for the Senate, has said he will not vote for Trump. So people who um, are concerned about Donald Trump's candidacy have a couple of choices. They can not vote for president at all. They can write somebody in. They can vote for Trump. They could vote for Hillary Clinton. Um, they could vote for a third party candidate, as Michael was talking about. Um, it doesn't look like, I mean, depending on what happens with the libertarians, if the libertarians actually win any states and win electoral votes, that could deny either Trump or Clinton a majority in the Electoral College, which would mean the election would be thrown into the House of Representatives, where each state has one vote. And so, depending on what happens with the election on Republicans, and or, or, or do the Republicans keep the House, do they lose it? So it could be very interesting. At least, in theory, it is possible that a third party candidate could be selected president by the House. So. Um, it just keeps getting more and more interesting. So there are a number of Republicans, however, who vote for Donald Trump, who, uh, who like him. Um, interesting cartoon about Trump. He's uninformed. He's divisive. He's irresponsible. He's immature. He's ill-mannered. He's arrogant. He's reckless. He's bigoted. He's an egomaniac. He's dangerous, he's naive, he's a liar, he's foul-mouthed, he's impulsive, he's a narcissist, he's unpredictable. He's my party's nominee, I think I'll support him. So, so these are not the mugwumps, okay? These are people who are going to say, regardless of uh, some of the concerns that people have about him, that they will support him as their uh, nominee. So I want to think a little bit about, you know, some of the things we've seen in this campaign and how should the nominees actually be selected. So we've heard a lot of talk on both sides from Sanders and Trump saying the process is rigged and, and, and it's against us. Well, Trump is now happy he's, he's going to get the nomination. Uh, Sanders is not. And so there's this huge conflict that we're, we're starting to see. It's a philosophical conflict. Who should select the nominee? Should it be the people through primaries and caucuses? Or should it be the party? Or should it be a combination of the two? Uh, so Democrats right now are kind of a combination of the two because they're the super delegates out there. Um, and, and the parties have a vested interest in having some control over who is selected as the nominee. So we've had, on both sides, we've had Donald Trump essentially hijack the Republican Party, and we have Bernie Sanders on the left uh, attempting to hijack the Democratic Party. He wasn't a, a Democrat until a year ago. Um, he's been a Democratic Socialist for his whole career. So the parties have this interest in getting a strong candidate uh, who can win nationally, who can help with uh, Senate and House races and uh, gubernatorial and senatorial races. There's lots of questions out there. What should these systems look like? Should it be uh, proportional, as the Democrats are? Should it be winner-take-all, which Republicans have lots of winner-take-all, which plays into the hand of a uh, plurality candidate, such as Donald Trump, to be able to win the nomination? So there's a lot of different issues out there. Uh, Bernie Sanders has raised the question wanting to change the rules at the Democratic Convention that would require superdelegates to vote for 
the candidate who won in that state, which kind of negates the value of superdelegates and why the Democratic Party put superdelegates into place in the, uh, originally. So th there's a lot of issues going on. I think we're going to see uh, discussion perhaps at the conventions and, and certainly between now and 2020 uh, because there's been a lot of unintended consequences based on how some of these rules have been set up. But at, at the core of it is this um, conflict between who should make the selection, the party or the people or a combination of the two. So what's going to happen at the conventions? Well, we think that uh, Clinton and Trump will get nominated. I say we think because this has been very unpredictable, so we don't know. At least in theory, it's possible that um, on both sides that uh, delegates, even though they may be officially bound, they could bolt. They could decide to vote for somebody else. I don't think that's going to happen, but it is at least uh, theoretically possible. Um, so, because we obviously have a lot of people who, who are unhappy with the choices. I think we may see uh, different levels of protest at these conventions. So, at the Republican convention, um, protests that may turn violent. Um, uh, violence, we, we've seen a lot of violence at Trump rallies. Um, on the Democratic side, I think we may see Sanders making a play to really make himself known. Sanders is going to try to influence the, the, the uh, platform and push it uh, further to the left. So let's talk about vice presidential picks a little bit. Um, and, and what are some of the big considerations that the candidates should be thinking about in deciding who to pick as a vice presidential nominee? So first of all is uh, being able to win votes. Uh, so uh, looking at the um, what, what does the vice president do in terms of geographic, uh, ethnically, from a gender perspective? How does that work? Um, secondly, the vice presidential candidate needs to be there to help in terms of actually governing. And um, so the, the modern vice presidency probably really began with uh, Walter Mondale in uh, 1977 when Jimmy Carter took office. And uh, Mondale gave Carter a paper with a lot of different ideas for what the, um, what the uh, vice president should be doing. And, and Carter accepted that, so Mondale became a very influential vice president. And then, and then almost most important is that the vice presidential nominee needs to be somebody who could actually become president, who could step into the president's shoes. And when we look at our presidents, 20% of our presidents have either died in office or resigned. And that means you've got a vice president who has then stepped in. That's nine individuals who have stepped in from the vice presidency into the presidency, sometimes with good results and sometimes not with uh, good results. I think it's also very critical in this election year to think about um, the age of the vice presidential nominees because Donald Trump would be the oldest president inaugurated for a first term. He would be 70. Clinton would be 69 at inauguration, just a hair younger than Ronald Reagan, who at this point in time is the oldest president for a first term. So what is Donald Trump looking for in a vice president? Here's what he said. He says, I do want somebody that's political because I want to get lots of great legislation we all want passed. We're going to probably choose somebody that's somewhat political. I'd want some, someone who could help me with governing. You want somebody that can help you with legislation and getting it through. So that's what he has said. Uh, he's recognizing his own weaknesses there and uh, saying he wants to, to get somebody who can help them. So the conservative commentator George Will um, had a very interesting statement about Trump's potential vice presidential nominee. He said the voters already know the important thing about Trump's choice. His running mate will be unqualified for high office. <laughs> 
because he or she will think Trump is qualified. <laughs> so that is one perspective there. So Trump's pool is shrinking. Uh, th there's a number of folks who have said, no thanks or no way uh, do they want to be considered. And there are some that Trump has said that he is not considering or would not consider. Now, things can change, of course, and so people on this list might change their mind or Trump might change his mind. But, but these are the folks so far who have um, either self-selected out or Trump has selected them out. So, who's he going to pick? Well, one option would be Newt Gingrich. So why Gingrich? So if you take Trump at his word that he wants somebody with governing experience, so the former House Speaker knows Washington, D.C. like not many people do. He knows it well. Um, he's uh, an insider, but he's not really considered an insider. Um, in some ways, you know, uh, Trump and Gingrich uh, have similar personalities. And, and they, they appear to be getting along well, although uh, Gingrich recently said some negative things about Trump and they've had a little spat. Um, Gingrich is older. He's 73 years old. Um, he would bring uh, foreign policy experience. He's somewhat of a, a self-styled intellectual, which would balance against Trump's anti-intellectualism. Um, so Gingrich is a real possibility, I think. You could look at the Tennessee Senator, Bob Corker, um, much more low-key than Donald Trump. Um, he's been in the Senate since 2007. He, he's a successful businessman, which may appeal to Trump. So he's had his own construction company, and more importantly, he ran two very large real estate companies before he got into politics as uh, the mayor of Chattanooga. You could look at John Kasich, who has said he doesn't want to be vice president. I, I think this would be a very surprising pick because I think personality-wise, I don't think Kasich uh, likes Trump very much. Uh, Kasich was the grown-up in the Republican uh, uh, primaries. Uh, but, but Kasich would bring incredible experience at both the state level and the federal level. So you know, Trump's um, criteria would be met in Kasich. And Kasich would also bring Ohio, or help bring Ohio. You could look at Chris Christie, New Jersey governor, um, came out for Trump when nobody else was uh, coming out for him. Uh, similar personality with Trump. Uh, he's a very dynamic campaigner. He would not bring the federal experience that Trump needs. Um, Trump uh, has appointed uh, uh, Christie to head up his transition team to the White House, and so that is going on right now. So Christie is a possibility. You could look at Ted Cruz. I don't think it's likely. Cruz uh, has very high unfavorability ratings. The, uh, the party hates him. Um, his former college roommate hates him. I mean, ma ma many people hate Ted Cruz. Um, but, but, but he's this social conservative who would appeal to people who are concerned about Trump being all over the map on social issues. For a while, during the primaries, uh, Trump and Cruz had, were getting along great. And, and, and then as Cruz began to become more of a threat, and Trump went after him, and Cruz went after Trump, and so I don't think that would be a, a likely pick, but it's a possibility. You could look at Mary Phelan, the uh, Oklahoma governor. Um, a little bit of an unknown nationally, does not bring national experience. Uh, she's a woman, so uh, that would be a balance to uh, people who are concerned about Trump's attitudes toward women. The question would be, could Trump get along with a woman? Um, so unlikely, I think, but it, it's been talked about. You could look at John Huntsman, the uh, former Utah governor. Um, much more moderate. He has come out, came out in February supporting Trump. 
and uh, he would bring international experience but not the federal experience which is what of course Trump needs. Or you could look at Scott Walker whose uh, campaign for president imploded almost before it got started. Uh, social conservative, uh, people would like him, does not have the federal experience however. And there's a whole host of other uh, possible vice presidential picks. Uh, you all may have some ideas as well. So that's it on the uh, Republican side. And Michael is going to tell us what's going to happen on the Democratic side. And I'm going to adjust the microphone because I feel like there's an echo. Are you hearing an echo? Yeah. So let me just do a quick test here before we get started again. So is that any better? No echo? OK, good. All right, so um, just to start on the Democratic side, I'll just um, read, a, you know, this is a snippet from an article that talks about how Hillary Clinton is going to make um, her decision, what she's looking for in a potential running mate. Um, it says, the most important thing is to pick someone you have absolute confidence in can be president, she said on Meet the Press on Sunday. That's more important than any characteristic. Clinton added that any vice president would have to be a good partner for her, one that she could work with and would help run the entire United States government. Um, and so what she is claiming is that she is going to be looking for somebody that could step into the role of president and that would likewise help her govern. Um, and, and I think that that's I think that's a smart approach um, to picking a vice president. So so that is making an assumption that um, picking a vice president is not necessarily a way in which you can increase your odds of getting elected. And from a political science perspective, a lot of the political science literature is very skeptical about the role of picking. Um, vice presidents in influencing whether or not you get elected. So vice pre picking a vice president can be very important in terms of governing, but I think that we're a little more skeptical, at least in terms of the data, about how much influence it, it plays in helping voters make a decision one way or another. Typically, the assumption is that voters make a decision about the, the leading candidate from both parties, not necessarily who the running mate. Um, if we look at um, if we look at elections since 1976, um, if we look at um, specifically elections where a nominee um, selected somebody from a swing state, um, so these are 14 total elections. Five times um, in those last 14 elections, a candidate selected somebody um, from a swing state. So those are the bolded elections here. Walter Mondale selected Geraldine Ferraro. Um, she was from New York at that time. New York was a swing state. Michael Dukakis uh, picked Lloyd Benson um, from Texas at that time. Um, Texas in 1976 voted for a Democratic candidate. So it was really in the 1980s on um, where, the, where Texas was really a Republican stronghold. Bill Clinton uh, picked Al Gore from Tennessee. Um, John Kerry picked John Edwards from North Carolina. Mitt Romney picked um, Paul Ryan from Wisconsin. These are the five times um, where, where candidates selected somebody uh, from a swing state. In four of those instances, that ticket lost. Uh, lost that state, I should say. So lost, um, lost the state. So this picking somebody from a particular state does not necessarily mean that you are going to, to win that state. Um, there was a recent book uh, that came out about the, the 2012 election. Um, and a couple of political scientists um, in this book, the book is called uh, The Gamble, uh, John Sides and Lynn Vavrick um, state um, that vice presidential selections have provided at best a very modest boost um, to the ticket on election day both overall and in their home states. And um, there's another uh, couple political scientists who wrote a book recently. It's Kyle Kopko and Christopher Devine. Um, and they wrote, uh, they wrote a book that said, Candidates can expect, um, you know, candidates expect in their home state to receive a bump of about three to seven percent. So, if you are a candidate from a state, uh, you're the nominee for your party, you're likely to see a boost of about three to seven percent. They say there's about zero boost if you're the vice presidential nominee from that state, and so there's reason to be skeptical of that. And they make the argument actually that it's 
it damages a campaign to make the assumption that because you select somebody from a swing state that that's going to help you in that state. So they use the example of the 2012 election. They say that Romney picked Ryan from Wisconsin and because Ryan was from Wisconsin, was popular in Wisconsin, the ticket thought we can do really well there. We should spend lots of money in that state. We should allocate lots of resources there that we wouldn't allocate had we not picked somebody from Wisconsin. They lost Wisconsin by seven percentage points. Um, that is no better than they were predicted to do. Um, and so assuming that you're going to get some boost by picking a vice president from a swing state can actually cause you to allocate resources in a way which is ultimately unhelpful. So using Clinton's criteria, let's, let's take a look at some of uh, the potential nominees. So uh, one of the main uh, nominees, uh, uh, potential nominees, is Julian Castro. He is the um, Housing and Urban Development uh, Secretary right now. He is the former mayor of San Antonio. He's considered a rising star in the Democratic Party. In 2012, he gave the keynote address at the Democratic National um, Convention. Um, he is somebody who is seen as having a, a bright future in the Democratic Party. He's young. Um, he's Hispanic. Um, one of the things that might be a drawback if you're using Hillary Clinton's measurement that, that you want somebody who could step into the role of president, um, he is relatively inexperienced. And so the only elected office that he's held is as mayor of, of San Antonio. And, and that is actually a part-time position. So, uh, you know, that is, uh, that, that would cause you to be maybe a little bit skeptical about his ability to govern. Um, another potential pick is Mark Warner. Um, he is currently a senator um, from Virginia. He is seen as moderate. Um, he is squeaky clean. Uh, no personal scandals, nothing to, to really uh, cause any red flags, um, but perhaps uh, too conventional. Um, doesn't necessarily appeal to Bernie Sanders um, voters um, who might be alienated um, with the Democratic Party uh, right now. And um, there's some reason to be concerned uh, because in 2014, um, he had a, a really close um, race as an incumbent in, in Virginia. And so um, he was seen as somebody who could win uh, or who could run in 2016 um, and ultimately, you know, did poorly enough um, in 2014 to kind of um, stifle those chances a bit. Um, John Hickenlooper, um, he is governor of Colorado, former mayor of Denver, owned a brewing company, so has some private sector uh, experience. Um, I think that most people uh, don't think that this is very likely. He wouldn't be a particularly exciting choice, but he does come from a potential swing state. So if you're somebody that buys into that stuff, then maybe he is uh, someone, uh, someone that you should keep in mind. Uh, Tim Kaine. Um, a lot of people see him as, uh, as a uh, you know, real leading contender. Uh, for Hillary Clinton in terms of the, the vice presidential race. Um, he was, uh, he's former chair of the DNC, so he has um, deep party ties. He's very connected in terms, of, uh, in terms of the party, but also in terms of the party's uh, fundraising apparatus. Um, he is the safest of safe picks. Uh, he is, he's a Virginia senator uh, right now. He is the former governor of Virginia deeply connected to the Democratic Party. Um, but, you know, some drawbacks, uh, he's not particularly exciting or uh, charismatic, um, and he doesn't necessarily appeal to, uh, to Bernie Sanders voters. Um, you know, he, he is the, you know, the quintessential party insider. Um, and so um, a lot of people think that he would be an incredibly uh, safe choice for Clinton if she chooses to go that route. Um, Evan Bayh. Um, is a uh, senator from Indiana. He is former um, Indiana governor. Um, he is, uh, he's, he's also, he would also be seen as an establishment candidate. His, his family has long ties to, to party politics um, in, in the state of Indiana. Um, he was runner-up um, as vice president uh, to, to Joe Biden um, for Barack Obama. Um, but, you know, some, some drawbacks can be found if you read uh, David Axelrod. He's a uh, 
he's a key advisor to to President Obama, or was a key advisor to President Obama um, during the 2008 election. Um, and he wrote a book afterwards that talked about the vice presidential process. And he said that Evan Bayh was low key, even flat, and said that he was safe but uninspiring. Um, and so you can look to uh, some Obama campaign officials, and, and I think that some of those uh, same criticisms might uh, apply today. You could uh, think outside of the box, and you could pick, uh, you could just leave the guy in place who's already doing the job. So certainly experience uh, being, being vice president. You can be vice president for as long as you want to. Uh, George Clinton... George Clinton was uh, VP under Jefferson, and uh, Madison John Calhoun was VP under John Quincy Adams and, and President Jackson, so it wouldn't be the first time in history that um, two presidents had selected the same uh, vice president, so you could keep him around. Um, there was an editorial in the Boston Herald by Colin Reed um, recently who said that you should uh, that, that Hillary should select Joe Biden because it would calm nerves about a potential indictment. Um, that he is uh, executive director of America Rising PAC. He's a, he's a super conservative person, so he has uh, you know some some stake in that. But uh, you know he argues that that would be a good idea. Joe Biden himself has mentioned the um, the chance that he would be selected as uh, vice president, but not for Hillary. He said uh, when talking about Trump, I anticipate he'll ask me to be vice president. <laughs> so he's at least floating floating the idea. Uh, one name that's gotten a lot of attention is Elizabeth Warren. Um, she is a senator from Massachusetts. Um, Harry Reid right now is actually, uh, he's engaging in a campaign to try to get um, Clinton to select um, Elizabeth Warren. Um, she, is, she is somebody who would certainly appeal to the Bernie Sanders uh, wing of the party. Um, she is someone who has taken strong stances against uh, against Wall Street, and she would be um, she would be somebody who would be uh, an exciting pick. It would also be an all female ticket, um, you know, which um, to Democratic voters could be something which um, which is exciting. Um, but there has been some personal animosity between Clinton and Warren. Um, additionally, Massachusetts right now has a uh, has a Republican governor, Charlie Baker, uh, meaning that if Hillary Clinton selected uh, selected Warren and and they ended up winning that a Republican governor would get to choose her replacement, at least until um, another um, special election could be held. Um, and so there is a chance that that would decrease um, Democratic uh, power in the Senate. And so that might be a reason why you wouldn't select her. And you'll see that is the case with some of these other nominees as well, including um, Sherrod Brown. Sherrod Brown um, is from, from the state of Ohio. Um, he is somebody who is, is seen as uh, seen as very liberal, he is, um, he's essentially, you know, a, a different version of Bernie Sanders. He could appeal to certainly that wing of, of the party. Um, he has, has a good track record. Um, but, you know, if he is selected, the real downside uh, to being selected would be that John Kasich is the governor in Ohio. He would appoint Sherrod Brown's replacement, once again decreasing um, the Democratic Party's power uh, in the Senate. She could pick Bernie Sanders, um, but you know he's older. Um, there's certainly animosity between the two of them. Um, he might not stick to the message um, that she wants him to to stick to, um, but he would bring a big coalition of new voters um, into the party, and it would be a way to keep those those young um, independent voters part of part of the process. And so it could make sense uh, in that way. Um, Tom Perez is somebody that, that I've heard uh, mentioned quite a quite a bit recently. Um, he is uh, he's currently um, the U.S. Secretary of Labor. Um, formerly, he was with the Justice Department as as part of the Justice Department. Um, he was very active in in fighting for voting rights, uh, civil rights, and against police brutality. Um, so he is he is well liked for his roles there. Um, also, as Secretary of Labor, he is beloved by labor unions. So um, it would be really helpful in turning out the vote uh, in that sense. Um, so, uh, you know, 
The downside is he's not well known. Um, a lot of people wouldn't know who he was, and so that might not be uh, the most exciting pick. And he doesn't have any real experience when it comes to when it comes to foreign policy. Um, Cory Booker, uh, New Jersey senator, is also somebody that that has been talked about. Um, he is he's young. Um, he is the former mayor of Newark. He is seen as charismatic. Um, but he's also somebody who uh, has been accused of being too close and too friendly with uh, with Wall Street, and so that might uh, you know sort of uh, cause Hillary Clinton problems, um, as that has been a criticism of her um, during this election process. Additionally, Democrats would lose a seat in this case as well. Uh, Chris Christie is governor of New Jersey. He would get to a point. Um, he would get to a point. Cory Booker's replacement, and you could pick Bill Clinton. <laughs> I like the face because it says, why not? <laughs> They're already traveling together. It just makes all sorts of sense. Um, which, you know, caused me to go back and read the, the, the 22nd Amendment to the Constitution. And I'll, I'll read that to you. You know, we all can use a good uh, lesson in the Constitution every once in a while. No person shall be elected to the office of the president more than twice. And no person who has held the office of the president or acted as president for more than two years of a term to which some other person was elected president shall be elected to the office of the president more than once. They didn't plan for this. So, you know, really the Constitution says you can serve as president for 10 years right now. But it assumes that somebody took, like it assumes that somebody started as vice president and for some reason had to take over the role of president for two years or less. And then they could run twice. Um, it doesn't assume, you know, that you take that role on the back end. So, uh, you know, it would be an interesting debate. You know, could, if something happened to Hillary Clinton, she had selected Bill Clinton, how long could he serve? Let's say there were three years left in the term. Well, well you could answer in questions. We'll get to that in just a minute. So maybe, maybe somebody has a really good answer to that. And so that was a, a debate that I was having with friends recently. Not going to happen, so not something to worry too much about. Um, other potential uh, vice presidential picks, uh, Michael Bloomberg, um, these are kind of outside the box, John Kerry, current Secretary of State, Jim Webb, who killed people in Vietnam, what he said in the, you know, uh, the debates, if you remember that, it was kind of uh, intense, uh, Martin O'Malley, um, and C Charlie Crist, uh, John Kasich, and maybe me. Uh, I don't have. I have some time over the summer as a teacher, so I could run, and we'll just see how things go. Um, I'm good at doing what I'm told. So, um, if you if you're a betting person, um, you can look at the you can look at the odds here. Uh, you know, uh, on the betting sites, we've talked about this before. Uh, Newt Gingrich, uh, you know, as of a couple days ago, Newt Gingrich was the leading candidate. Now that they've been fighting, um, I'm not sure if those numbers have gone down or not. Um, followed by Scott Brown, former uh, senator from Massachusetts, Joni Ernst, uh, Bob Corker, John Kasich, Chris Christie, Jeff Sessions, um, you know, uh, some other people that are kind of grouped together there. But that's where the betting certainly uh, stands right now for the Republican side. On the Democratic side, Julian Castro um, is, is in the lead, at least in the betting markets. Um, Tim Kaine follows close behind. Elizabeth Warren, Martin O'Malley, um, Tom Perez, Sherrod Brown, and then lots of people sort of lumped, um, lumped in after that. Bill Clinton, 66 to 1. So she picks him. Now's a good time to put in like 10 bucks. You're going to really make a killing. Um, recently, um, I don't know if you had a chance to see this, but, um, but I think that it's, it's uh, something that we should certainly watch here. Uh, Mike? Um, had a chance to talk to to CNN recently, uh, and, and talking about this very question about who um, who would be picked uh, as the the vice presidential nominee for for both parties. And so uh, so it was really it's it's exciting. Um, it's exciting for us who know Mike um, to see him on on national television in this way, and I'm sure it was exciting for Mike as well. So let's let's watch what he had to say at this time. And now that it's on television, we can hold him to this forever. Well, I think you're absolutely right. I think uh, 
this is going to be totally unprecedented. We've never had, obviously, an active president uh, living in the White House, and so the Clinton fix is going to be critical. Um, you know, the Vice Presidency is the historic position uh, historically, in that you know, 20% of the Vice Presidents have uh, gone on to become President of the United States after the resignation of the President. Some say Clinton needs a Vice President. A uh, vice president who will put for a running mate, I should say, who appeals to Sanders voters and can attack Donald Trump. That kind of sounds like Elizabeth Warren, Senator Elizabeth Warren. But could an all female ticket work? I think an all female ticket would work. Uh, the Democrats would be problematic. Um, I think uh, Hillary Clinton has uh, difficulties in attracting men voters, and an all female voter I think would be too risky. I think her best bet. Probably pick uh, Sharon Brown of Ohio, who appeals to the liberal wing of the Democratic Party, um, who could be a good uh, attack uh, candidate during the campaign, and um, we're pretty Ohio as well. So let's talk about the Republican side. Donald Trump needs someone who has governmental experience. That's what he says he wants. So who would be a good choice for him? Well, I think the top of Trump's list uh, probably is. Cambridge uh, Green was obviously great experience in knowing Washington, D.C., which is what Trump lacks. And uh, so I think Cambridge is a top candidate. He's a early supporter of Trump. And I, I think they have similar personalities and would mesh well together. Uh, maybe second choice might be Chris Christie for uh, some of the same reasons that Christie doesn't have the uh, federal government experience. Why wouldn't a female running mate well, uh, I, I think it would be a risky proposition for Trump to do that. Um, I think that he uh, may have difficulty getting along with someone. I mean, one of the main things that worked with Manny Cobb and Sarah Palin, who I think brings her own set of issues, and I think Trump recognizes that uh, she might not be the best fit. Uh, Sarah Palin herself has said that she uh, would be concerned about being a draw down. What about the Oklahoma governor? Uh, it, she is definitely a possibility. Uh, but again, if you look at what Trump has said, and I think Trump, for all you might want to say about him, uh, recognizes where he has weaknesses. And uh, so the Oklahoma governor's uh, challenge would be not for you, the federal experience. And uh, again, that's where I think I think Richard Trump would be perfectly good. Mike Purdy, thanks for joining me. I appreciate it. So I got a call at 5 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I was still sleeping because I hadn't gone to bed till midnight the night before. 5 o'clock in the morning, CNN says, can you be ready for a live Skype interview in an hour and a half? <laughs> okay. So I pulled myself together. <laughs> Made that work. Okay. So we want to talk about what's going to happen in the general election. And I think that there are a number of what I would call disruptive events that could happen that could turn around and shake up the race even more. Um, one is third parties, and we've uh, kind of talked about that already. Uh, what might the impact be of the Libertarian Party, and who are they going to draw votes from more? Um, secondly is we've got this issue of uh, fractured parties on both sides, and we've got some probably more people on the Republican side, the, the mugwumps of the Republicans who say they won't support Trump, and what impact is that going to have? And then when we look at the actual candidates, we've got this issue of uh, Hillary Clinton's email that continues to hang on as an issue. Um, what happens when the, uh, the, the federal government, the FBI, comes out with the results of their investigation? What does it say? Is that problematic for Clinton, depending on what they end up saying? I, Trump has his own set of issues, uh, his tax records, which he has steadfastly refused to release, um, and then the controversy over his practices with Trump University and some of the documents, uh, the judge recently saying those documents needed to be disclosed and what those documents show about how he managed Trump University. 
we've got um, both health and safety issues for the candidates. Health issues because they are both older. So Clinton is 69, Trump 70, Trump will be 70, I think, this month. And, um, and then there's safety issues. So we talked in some of the earlier lectures about uh, previous campaigns where there's been campaign violence and attempted assassinations or actual assassinations of candidates. Um, so that is an issue out there. And particularly, I think, because um, so many passions are being stirred up by some of the rhetoric in this campaign. And then there's a number of external events that could uh, make changes in what happens. Uh, sometimes this is called, you know, you have the October surprise, things that happen in October that can turn an election around. Uh, what if there's a terrorist attack, either on United States soil or uh, on uh, another country? Uh, campaign violence in terms of protests, uh, violence uh, at rallies, things like that. Uh, what if there's an economic collapse in the United States? What does that do? How does that change things? Or some very large international crisis. So all of these kinds of things have the impact, uh, potential impact, to really disrupt things and to change things. So Michael showed us the real clear politics average of polls as of today, 44% Clinton, 42% Trump. That's a reflection as of today. Um, people are going to start to pay attention to things a lot more as we get into the fall. And as some of these issues uh, disruptive events occur uh, that could change things even more. So I want to think about some themes that we may see in this general election. Um, so first of all, I've included insults because um, Donald Trump's mode of operation is to insult. So if you criticize Donald Trump about anything, uh, he does not deal with the substance of the criticism, but he will attack personally uh, the person who uh, was the messenger, and his comments are quite vitriolic. And, and so I think we're going to continue to see a lot of that in this campaign. This is probably going to be one of the, it will be, I think, the nastiest uh, presidential campaigns that we've ever seen. We, we've had all campaigns where there is some level of insulting going on, but this is a much, much heightened level. Fundraising is going to be an issue. Uh, I think particularly on the Republican side, Donald Trump uh, prided himself on self-financing his uh, races through the primaries, um, but he's not willing to put in the billion dollars that's necessary for a general election. He has no campaign finance infrastructure in place, so he's got to build that now. And uh, you, you couple that with the fact that there's many Republican donors who are not willing to um, donate given uh, Trump at the head of the ticket. There's a number of um, um, issues, policy issues, that are going to we're going to see themes of uh, religious conflicts. You know, the whole issue of banning Muslims, uh, sexual politics, whether it's gay marriage or abortion, LGBT issues, trade and jobs is going to be a, a big issue, and, and, and terrorism and safety within. United States. So I think those are going to be some of the overarching themes that we see in the campaign. Then there's this issue of uh, what I call pragmatism versus purity. So we've got um, the Tea Party on the Republican side at an extreme, um, many of whom are not happy with Donald Trump. On the Republican side, you've got the San or Democratic side, you've got the Sanders wing who uh, doesn't think that Hillary Clinton goes far enough. So what are these voters going to do? Um, how are they going to be active during the campaign? And how are they going to vote? Or are they going to vote? Uh, so I, I think that's going to be a, an issue to watch during the campaign. We've got debates, which will be their own interesting events. You can see the dates here um, in, in mid-September and then in October, and then the vice presidential debate on October 4th. The ground game, we talked about ground game at one of the earlier lectures, and the ground game is how well do the candidates and the parties do on getting their voters out to the polls? And that is going to be absolutely essential for 
what this election really looks like and how it turns out. Um, I mean, I think the Democrats probably have a demographic edge, um, but it would depend on if they get their votes out. Uh, there's a lot of Republicans who don't like Hillary Clinton, so they may just vote for Trump. Um, so a lot of dyna dynamics there. And then we've got the Electoral College map, which we're going to hear a lot of discussion about over the next uh, five months. And, and Michael is going to kind of walk us through that at the end and kind of uh, give some predictions on that. So I want to um, just talk about some closing reflections, uh, kind of summarizing some of the things that we have talked about in the uh, previous six lectures before tonight. Um, you know, first of all, that this has obviously been an unprecedented uh, campaign and that we've got um, two populists on either side that have really defined this campaign and that have stirred a lot of passions amongst supporters. Uh, this is the campaign that nobody expected a year ago when everybody thought that it was going to be Hillary Clinton being coronated as the nominee and running against Jeb Bush. It was going to be another Bush-Clinton uh, election, and, and, and things have totally changed. So it's unprecedented. It's also unprecedented given the level of campaign discourse. And so the, uh, some of the language that's been used, the lack of civility, the, uh, the lack of respect, the bullying, and we've had bullying, we've had insults in the past, but not at this level. Um, you could look at presidents who have done bullying. So Lyndon Johnson was uh, known for that. It was called the Johnson Treatment, where he would stand right in your face, right up against you, he'd grab your shirt collar, and he would uh, threaten, cajole you, sweet talk you uh, to get his way. So this is the Johnson treatment, and he was a bully, and he got his way. I, I think this is also the, 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 the level of um, what we have heard in terms of insults is unprecedented, both in terms of its viciousness and in terms of its visibility. So it is all out there on social media. It's all out there on Twitter, and that's how people attack one another now. Um, and Donald Trump has, uh, for all you may say about Donald Trump, he is a master brander. He knows his brand. He knows his message. He stays on message. And, um, and, and he gets that message out. So we've seen a lot of changes historically on how campaigns have worked. I mean, the early days of the Republic, we, did, we had candidates who didn't talk about issues at all. Um, they were just silent. Now, you could say in this campaign, we've got some candidates who aren't talking specifics at all. They're talking broad generalities, but no specifics. We've gone from, um, you know, early caucuses and, and Congress who actually used to select the presidential nominees to moving to barbecues and parades and front porch campaigns mass rallies, and we've seen kind of a reemergence of mass rallies this election cycle, um, and, and then social media. So we've seen this huge evolution and shift of campaign methods over time. We, we've also seen over time the, the increased time that we have campaigns. Um, so it used to be a, like a, a two-month, one-month or two-month cycle. People would decide, oh yeah, I guess I'll run for president. And, and then they didn't campaign. It was undignified for candidates to actually do campaigning. And now we've got a, a, a two-year cycle where people are running. But that two-year cycle gives the public a chance to really get to know the candidates and gives the candidates the ability to hopefully grow and learn in the process. I talked about the nomination process tension. And that is, should the parties make the decision should the people make the decision? Should it be a combination? And we're going to see um, more and more discussion about that, I think, in the, the days ahead. I 
think we need to think about how do we evaluate candidates holistically. So in one of the lectures we talked about the things we should be looking at. We should look at their policy positions, certainly. Um, but I think most importantly that we need to look at the temperament of candidates, um, their civility, their, um, their character, um, their, their pragmatism, their ability to actually get things accomplished. Um, you know, candidates who make broad statements without the ability to actually accomplish things, obviously they're, they're pandering to their base, trying to get votes, but um, I think as a society and as a country, we need to make sure that we are thinking more carefully about some of the issues, about who can be a successful president, actually. And, and I think in this case, we, we need to look at age and health as well of the candidates. We've seen in this election cycle in particular uh, just a huge polarization of society uh, from, from the Tea Party to the Sanders wing. And, um, and, and we've seen lots of issues come up where people are, are very polarized, whether it's about religion, race, sexual politics, immigration, gun control, you can name all of these issues. And there's very, very different opinions about it. And, and what, what, I, what I think we need, and I don't know how we accomplish this, is, is a greater level of um, civility and uh, deliberate discussion about the issues. And so what I argue for is that we, we try to agree on the principles that we all can accept. And we, we, we all want to have a stable society. We all want our country to be safe. We all want people to have enough to eat. A whole bunch of things that we can all agree upon and then have the conversation about how do we actually accomplish that? How do we implement it? And we are going to disagree as a country about how we actually implement those items. Uh, but I think we need to somehow, as a nation, move beyond uh, demonizing the other side and uh, talk about solving real problems. So those are my closing reflections. And Michael is going to uh, take us through the um, Electoral College and what might that look like uh, come November. Okay, uh, so I felt like um, we had this title um, for the, the lecture series, Who Will Win the White House? Um, and we haven't answered that question yet. And so what you're going to get is my best attempt uh, to answer that question. So um, you can hold me to this. We'll have lectures uh, in the fall. And if I am wrong, then you can mercilessly mock me. Um, and and that, is, that is OK. Um, so first, I want to present what I think is the most optimistic picture for a Trump supporter. So Trump has said, I'm going to win. Let's look at some, some swing states. He says, I'm going to win Michigan by a lot. Republicans don't go there. Horror show, closing factories there. Okay. So he is saying that he is going to win Michigan. Uh, Michigan has voted for the Democratic candidate since 1988. I think the best way um, that we can analyze some of these states is to say, how well does he have to do relative to how Mitt Romney did in 2012? and then whether or not we think that that is possible. So I'm going to say that in these states, he needs to get to 49% of the vote. You know, that's, that's a little bit of a conservative estimate. He might have to get more than that. But I'm, I'm taking into account the fact that there might be um, some influential um, third party support in, in some of these states, and 49% of the vote would be enough um, to win those states. So if we look at Michigan, for example, he would have to win about 4% of the vote to get to 49%, or he would have to win 4% more than Mitt Romney did uh, in, 2000, in 2012. So if we, if we look at whether or not that's possible or not. So let's look um, at presidential elections in the last 20 years. Uh, if you look at uh, the year 2000, um, George W. Bush improved about eight percentage points on where Bob Dole was in 1996. And so it is conceivably possible that Donald Trump would win 
in Michigan, at least according to, to that measure. And so we'll toss Michigan in, in the Trump camp. If we go to Pennsylvania, he would have to win a little over 2% of the vote, more than Romney. So to get to 49%, Romney had 46.6%, needs about 2.4% more, uh, more votes than, than Romney um, in, in 2012. Um, is that possible? Well, again, if we look at 1996 to 2000, in 1996, uh, Bob Dole had 40% of the vote in Pennsylvania. George W. Bush, 2000, 46.4% of the vote. And so... Conceivably, it is possible that a Republican would improve by a couple percentage points in Pennsylvania. And so let's toss that in, in the Trump camp. Pennsylvania, by the way, hasn't voted for a Democratic can or a Republican candidate since 1988. California. Donald Trump says we're gonna play heavy as an example in California. Other GOP candidates wouldn't even come here for a dinner. Um, there's a reason why that's true, it turns out. Um, so he would have to do about 12 points better than Mitt Romney did in 2012. Um, is that possible? Well, again, the, the biggest gain for a Republican candidate in the last 20 years um, was with George W. Bush over Bob Dole, and he improved about three percentage points. Um, Donald Trump in no world is going to win California. So we're not going to give that to him, even under what I think is the most optimistic scenario for Trump. Illinois. Um, in Illinois, Donald Trump says, I put so many states in play, Michigan being one, Illinois. Illinois is its own sentence there, which I think is interesting. I'm from Illinois, so I appreciate that you put that as its own sentence. Um, Romney got about 40, uh, almost 41% of the vote, so he would have to improve about eight percentage points. Again, if we look at, if we look at past history, we look to, again, the 1996 to 2000 um, jump, you can see that there's about a six percentage point drum, uh, jump there. That would not be enough. So even if Donald Trump matches the best performance for a Republican candidate relative to a previous Republican candidate, um, in this election, that would not be that would not be enough to win, and so we won't give that to him. And Illinois hasn't voted for uh, a Republican candidate since 1988. New Jersey, we're going to win in New Jersey, according to Trump. Um, he would need to improve um, about eight and a half percentage points over Mitt Romney. Um, is that possible? Well, the, the best performance um, was, uh, the best jump uh, from a previous election was 2000, 2004. So uh, what you saw was George W. Bush had about 40% of the vote in 2000, um, had about 46% of the vote in, um, in 2004. So a six percentage point jump, um, that, would not be, um, that would not be enough um, in New Jersey. New York, he says, we're going to focus on New York. Of other GOP candidates, they wouldn't spend 10 cents in New York. Again, there's a reason why that's true. Um, he would need to improve 14 percentage points over Romney. Um, that won't happen. You know, we talked about before how uh, political science research suggests that you're going to receive about a three to seven point jump in your home state. Even if that was true, that would not be enough um, to swing the vote. Uh, in favor of Donald Trump um, in New York. New York has not voted um, for a Republican candidate um, since, uh, since the 1980 election. New Mexico, um, he would need to improve about, um, about six percentage points in order to reach that 49% threshold. Um, if we look at the best performance of a Republican candidate, um, in recent memory, it was, again, George W. Bush in 2000 relative to Bob Dole. Um, George W. Bush got 40, uh, about 48% of the vote. Uh, uh, Bob Dole had about 42% of the vote. Um, that is, you know, that difference there would be enough to potentially swing the vote in favor of, of Donald Trump were he to make that same sort of leap 
um, in 2016. Um, so we can give New Mexico, uh, we can give New Mexico to Donald Trump. And more recently, people have been questioning whether or not Wisconsin would be in play as a result of uh, Paul Ryan's endorsement. I've already talked about the danger of assuming that Paul Ryan has this much uh, power in the state of Wisconsin to dramatically change presidential elections by himself, but he would have to uh, increase uh, the margin for the Republican candidate by about three percentage points. Um, that that has uh, that has happened before. Um, so again, if you look at 1996 to 2000, there was about um, there was about a, almost a 10 point increase in support for the Republican candidate during that time period. So it is conceivably possible that a Republican candidate would make that sort of jump in the state of Wisconsin if we're looking at historical precedent. Um, and so if we give those states to Donald Trump, we give him Wisconsin, we give Pennsylvania to him, we give New Mexico to him, we give Mi Michigan to him under the most optimistic scenarios for a Republican candidate that I can imagine. He ends up with um, 242 electoral votes with these states remaining. Um, Hillary Clinton would have about 196 electoral votes. Um, that would leave um, him to, to try to get 28 electoral votes out of the remaining 87 that were left. Um, if he was doing that well in all of those other states, he would pick up those electoral votes. That's how Donald Trump wins. Donald Trump wins if you assume that he performs as well as any Republican candidate has performed in all of those, in all of those states in the last 20 years. That's not going to happen. That won't happen. You can be afraid of that, and we should, we, you know, you can be afraid of that, and if you are somebody who wants to stop that from happening, then you should get involved uh, politically and, and try to do your part in preventing that from happening. But demographics have changed um, over time. The percent of the white vote um, in the United States in almost every single state has declined. The percent of non-white votes has increased in almost every single state in the last 20 years. And so the, the demographics are not the same as when George W. Bush was making those gains between 1996 and 2000, for example. It is much more difficult to make that sort of jump in today's modern political environment. Um, for example, if we look at the state of Pennsylvania, Allentown, Pennsylvania is the fastest growing city in Pennsylvania. If we look at the demographic characteristics of Allentown, what you can see is that between the 2000 census and the 2010 census, um, the percent of uh, white people living in that area has declined, the percent of African Americans has increased, the percent of Hispanics has increased, and the percent of people identifying as um, an other race uh, that, that isn't fit, uh, doesn't fit into those categories has, has increased. And so minority voters are increasing in these areas, and that will make it incredibly difficult for Donald Trump to perform better than any Republican candidate in the last 20 years um, in these swing states. So where does that leave us? This is my map. Okay. Um, I have Hillary Clinton winning by 347 electoral votes, Donald Trump getting uh, 191 electoral votes. This is the same map as the map that existed in um, 2012. So these, these are Obama's results with one difference, um, that I think Hillary Clinton will win North Carolina. Um, polls there suggest things are pretty close, although those polls are done incredibly, incredibly early. I just don't see a place where Donald Trump wins, given the changing demographics of American society. I don't see a place where he wins that Romney didn't win. I only see places where he could lose that, Ar that Romney won. Um, so, I could be totally, I could be totally off on this. Um, don't use this as, as your guide to how to view the election necessarily, but hold me responsible for it. So this is, this is how I think things would play out. Um, if you want to, uh, if you want to hear more analysis from Mike, we've got, we're going to have more lectures, but we're also going to be on um, KBTC uh, on election night. Um, too. So we're going to be the election night um, commentators. So we'll just be making stuff up all night. We can... <laughs> it's so anti-political science to be the election night commentator because you're just providing ad hoc uh, examples for all of these things. But that, that'll be November, November 8th.
Uh, channel 12? Channel 12? Okay. Okay, so that's, that's what we've got. I hope that you've enjoyed things so far. Um, we're happy to answer questions. We'll take about 10 minutes or so of questions, and then we'll turn it on and see what uh, other results are coming in. Yes? So the question relates to, so yes, we've had uh, changing demographics, but we've also had uh, impacts on the Voter uh, Rights Act and voter suppression, and how do those things balance out or, or not? Michael? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think, that's, I think that's a really interesting, I think that's a really interesting and really important um, question. Um, I don't know um, that we have, uh, I, I need to look at the research because we, we've only had um, there, there's not a lot of data about how much suppression is occurring. Um, the assumption is that those, uh, those changes in voting rights are going to impact um, largely voters who would typically side with the Democratic Party. Um, I don't know how that will impact a presidential um, election yet. Um, and I do think that that is, that is something to be um, that, that is something to be concerned about, and that could be a reason why I'm wrong. Yeah, that's a good question. Yes? Um, I have a question about the first slide, Michael, that you showed about the um, 13 million voters for Hillary. Yeah. The math on that confused me, because there were 13 million for Hillary, 11 for Trump, and 9 for Bernie. Mm -hmm. Does that mean there are more Democrats voting? Well, the, so the question... We're not include. Oh, yeah, go ahead. So the question relates to the slide showing the number of popular votes that the candidates have gotten in the uh, election. And so uh, Clinton about 13 million, Trump about 11 million, and about 9 million for Sanders. So the question is, does that mean there's a lot more Democrats voting? What we have to remember is Trump was just a portion of the Republican vote. So you had, you know, Cruz and Rubio and all the other 16 candidates that weren't factored in on there. So if we added those in, then we'd see them being a little bit more balanced. Yeah. Yeah, and if we added in Jim Gilmore. Um... I, th I think, he, yeah, he, he got 12 <laughs> votes in Iowa, so. Um... <laughs> yes. So how are votes that are cast in caucus states factored in? With respect to the electoral college, you're saying, or what? what just in, in the primaries. So, uh, what, what happens? I mean, caucuses uh, function somewhat differently by different states, but um, you know, because you've got people who come together, and uh, the, usually uh, they're going to be the party faithfuls or people who are really passionate about a particular candidate, and then the Delegates are going to be awarded um, generally proportionally based on that. Yes? I would like to know who is actually counting the votes here in America? Is this an independent company or is this the same crap what they did in Florida when they cheated on the votes? <laughs> so the question is who's <laughs> counting the votes in the country and is it honest? Well, it's done on a state by state basis. And um, I mean, we saw some things in 2000 where there were questions raised in Florida, um, but it's a state-by-state -state, uh, thing. But about they're it. independent, or they're well, they're usually, usually each state has a, a, a secretary of state who, who their responsibility is to manage the election process. So it's a government function to uh, to run the elections and to do the vote counting. So is it possible to cheat? Is it possible to cheat? Absolutely. Absolutely. It, it happens. Yes? Can I say something about that? Sure. Congress passed a law called the Help America Vote Act after 2000. So now most of the voting nationwide with federal funds to help out is often with stamp paper ballots. So that should make it more honest. 
We hope so. Yeah, but my question yeah. is, you said there, there's been an unprecedented lack of stability in the selection cycle. Um, did you overlook George Wallace in 1968 and 1972, Strom Thurmond, who was Democratic governor of South Carolina in 1948, and former Ku Klux Klansman Senator Robert Byrd of West Virginia, who ran in 1976. I, I looked at some of their speeches. They made some of the stuff that Trump said that, uh, you know, pretty mild. So, so I think you're right. You've raised um, a number of examples of some pretty inflammatory candidates uh, historically. Um, I think one of the differences is um, they did not have the, uh, the access to the media or social media like we see now, so we hear a lot more. And I think also those candidates, uh, they ran as third-party candidates. They were not the... In 72, well, yes, but he, he wasn't the nominee. Well, I know, but you were talking about candidates, not right. the nominees. Right, sure, sure. Yeah, and, and, and I guess I would still say, uh, notwithstanding those very good examples, I would still say that I think Trump, and I haven't gone back and listened to the other speeches like, like you have recently, but I think Trump's level of uh, rhetoric is probably much more heightened than others. Well, I, I think that we would caution that if the question is, has there ever been more racism, the, that, the answer is decidedly, yes, there has, yes. Been, there has been more racist candidates. So um, I think that when we talk about civility, what we're talking about is intra-candidate. Um, so like, so dialogue between candidates um, during the election and not necessarily dialogue about groups of people because there has been some really nasty campaigns in the history of American politics, and we're luckily uh, not during those times, although I, I think there's reason to be alarmed now as well. Well, with the internet and social media, anything that's said now within five minutes. Sure. Everybody, yeah, there's no filter. Everybody and, knows it. Everybody knows it right away. Uh, Jack. Uh, question about the uh, running mates and the effect on the election for Michael. Uh, you started out saying they have little to no effect, uh, and how they're, they have no effect, possibly negative effect on the home state. Um, we're going through talking about uh, whether they could bring in the yeah. whether they could bring in the demographic. I'm wondering if you think that that is viable, or is there any other demographic, like women, um, older, younger voters, um, or politically centrist or leading? Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and so I think that um, you know, for for a general election, Hillary Clinton is going to have to make appeals to these uh, to certain groups. Um, it's going to be incredibly important that the base turns out to vote for Clinton. So really, she doesn't have to worry about expanding the electorate necessarily. If the Democratic base turns out to vote on election day, she will win. Um, now there are lots of ways that you can go about doing that. One of the tool, one of the ways that you could do that was to, you know, an olive branch would be to pick somebody that would be friendly to to Bernie voters. There also were probably policy positions that you would want to take, or you would want to do some things with the platform committee, or change um, rules regarding super delegates, or things like that. There's a number of different. Um, tools at your disposal. So I don't want to reject the idea that the, the vice presidential selection is entirely meaningless. Um, but in terms of um, the percent of the vote that you get, it's really difficult to calculate. So from, from a numbers perspective, it's difficult to say that, that there's going to be um, this much of an increase uh, in the percent of the popular vote that you're going to receive if you select this nominee over, over this potential. Um, nominee. So, so it might have some impact, but how it impacts might be uh, pretty difficult to, to put a precise figure on. Back there in the green room.
do they not? Are they not reflected at all? I see. So the question relates to the um, the statistic we showed with the 12 million uh, votes and things like that. Um, and, and are those reflecting caucuses? Um, I. I don't know for sure. I believe that's just a primary statistic, though. Do I know that Bernie doesn't play a caucus Yes, absolutely. Right. Yeah, I'd have to go back to the source on that. I don't remember. Yeah, good question. Yeah, I think that they're, you know, they're, they're ultimately, you can't count a caucus. It's pretty difficult to count. And so some Bernie, like Bernie supporters would say that because Bernie does better in caucuses, that you should disregard the popular vote numbers. Um, on the other side, you would say that caucuses are sort of, they're anti-democratic parts of caucuses that you might, um, you might say, well, that's not democratic. We shouldn't uh, we shouldn't support those systems anyway. Uh, so yeah, I mean, so it's it's an interesting part of this. We're going to take two more questions. We're going to take this question here and this gentleman down here. Yes. Back to the amount of vitriol in the elections. Mr. Trump, of course, started out at a high level, but I get the reaction in the last weeks that it is going after the judge in the case of Trump University that has had a tremendous impact at this point on the whole process. Can you comment on that? Yeah, so the, the question relates to uh, Trump's level of rhetoric, but that in the past week or so, Trump going after the judge who is presiding over the Trump University case, that that has um, really um, gotten a lot of people's attention and upset a lot of people because of what is viewed as some fairly racist comments. And uh, so, Michael, observations? Yeah, I mean, the way that I would look at this is, you know, maybe we were bound to reach a tipping point, right? That this isn't, this isn't decidedly worse than other things uh, that have been said. You know, attacking John McCain's uh, military service, um, not being quick to disidentify with uh, with David Duke. These are things that are pretty terrible, right? But there's, um, there, there might be some cumulative effect and we reach some point at which people say, okay, this is just like, there, there's too much in this basket, we can't hold it anymore, right? Um, and so there's a question as to whether we ever get to that moment. There's some people right now who are arguing that, that we might have reached that moment with, um, with this issue related to, to the judge. I think that, that maybe we're, it, maybe it's too early to, to tell that right now. Certainly, um, you know, in, in the media we've heard a lot about this, but I don't actually know, um, I don't have numbers that, that indicate how people are responding to this. How are Trump supporters responding to this? How are, um, you know, even moderate Republicans responding to some of these comments, and are they significant enough to cause them perhaps not to vote for him in, in a general election? So. Um, you know, is it just that the people who would normally get mad at Trump are mad at Trump again, or is it people that might have voted for Trump who are now mad and might not vote? And I think that that's still an open question. Last question. Okay. Um, can you give us some history on superdelegates and how they came about and what, what they are really? Sure. So the question relates to the superdelegates that the Democratic Party has and what they are and how they came about. So they came about after the 1972 uh, election, so Democrats um, selected George McGovern, so a very, uh, very liberal fringe candidate. Um, and I think there was concern on the Democratic Party's part that um, the party had lost control of the selection process. So they said, okay, we're going to have these primaries, but we also want to have party officials and the establishment in the party have um, a say as well in the selection to prevent, you know, a hijacking of the party from occurring. So the superdelegates are generally um, elected officials, um, um, party leaders, and, and they are not bound to um, any candidate. Unlike in the primaries and caucuses, the uh, delegates are bound on the first ballot to that candidate. Uh, superdelegates can go with whoever they want. So Hillary Clinton has a large lead now on superdelegates. Uh, Bernie Sanders hopes that he can convince all those superdelegates to vote for him on the first ballot 
at the convention and so that he could win the nomination. So how did she get all those superdelegates? Yeah, so how did Clinton get all those superdelegates? Um, probably relationships. She has, uh, you know, extended relationships, good ground, game, good ground game. She has extended relationships with these individuals. Sanders, remember, um, has not been a Democrat uh, except for the last year. So he's kind of been a backbench senator, not involved in Democratic politics. And those are the people who then make these decisions. And so that's why he's got 44 superdelegates and Hillary has 500 and something. Yeah. So we're going to take a, uh, a little quick uh, break. You can choose to stay or leave. Uh, we're going to turn on the news here and we're going to see what's been going on in California and elsewhere. Thank you.